Cool. Awesome. There is the thing for the week. Get my notes up. And get rolling. All right. This week, vulnerability management. Vulnerability management programs play a crucial role in identifying, prioritizing, and remediating vulnerabilities in our environments. They detect new vulnerabilities as they arise and implement a remediation workflow that addresses the highest priority vulnerabilities. Every organization should incorporate vulnerability management in their cybersecurity program. In other words, you got to find out all the ways that people can get in. And you have to routinely make sure that you know all the possible ways that somebody can get in. That's what a vulnerability scanner does. It looks at your infrastructure and says, hey, I found holes here, here, and here. Go patch them. It gives you a order of priority. Well, it doesn't give you an order. It just tells you, hey, I found 36 holes, and 10 of them are critical, and five of them are meh. And it's up to you to decide which ones you're going to tackle first, second, third, fourth, and so on. So you got to, the first thing you got to do is identify who are you going to scan. So uh, what kind of data are we talking about? What kind of systems are we talking about? Are they exposed to the internet? Are they uh, semi-exposed? What services are running on them? Is the system we're about to scan a production system, a test system, a development? Because all of those things matter. The last thing you want is to run a scan on a real-time operating system who does not have the bandwidth or capability to handle something new, freak out, stop working, stop production, and cause the company money. You want to know what you're about to scan before you scan it. Because there's a lot of devices who just can't handle it. They will brick. They will die. They will be overwhelmed. Organizations also use automated techniques to identify systems that may be covered by a scan. Cybersecurity professionals use scanning tools to search the network for connected systems and build an asset inventory. You really should know what's on your network, all the devices. Admins may supply additional information that help make determinations about which systems are critical and which are not. Asset inventory and asset criticality helps guide decisions about the type of scans performed, the frequency and priority administrators should place on remediating vulnerabilities detected. Again, you don't just scan just to scan. There's a reason to the madness. You got to pick who you're doing and when. Speaking of when, it's all about the frequency. Uh, professionals depend on automation to help be efficient and effective. Admins must factor a number of influences to determine how often to conduct the scan. You gotta start with your risk appetite. If an organization is risk adverse, it may choose to conduct more scans frequently. You gotta check your regulatory requirements. It's imposed by things like uh, PCI DSS or FISMA. Any, any rules or laws may dictate how often scans must happen, or at least a minimum number of scans. There may be technical constraints. Again, the, the device may not be able to handle that many scans in such a short amount of time. Also have to think about the business constraints. There, might, there may be periods of high business activity, and the last thing you want is to add more noise into the time when the company is making the most money. And also licensing. That can also curtail the bandwidth consumed by the scanner or the number of scans that happen simultaneously. Configuring your vulnerability scanners, as with any tool, is important. You want to pay careful attention to the configuration settings. They determine the type of checks that the scanner will perform and should be customized to ensure the scan meets the objectives while minimizing the possibility of disrupting the target environment. Improve the scan by configuring any plugins that will work 
during the scan. Each plugin performs a check for a specific vulnerability. Those that are unnecessary should be disabled to reduce the number of false positives detected. So a basic scan will run over a network, probing a, a system from the distance. This provides a realistic view of the system security by simulating what an attacker might see from another network vantage point. Firewalls, IDSs, IPSs, and other security tools along the path may provide an inaccurate view of the security independent of those controls. Vulnerability scanners can use credentials to allow the scanner to connect to the target and retrieve it configuration information to determine if a vuln actually exists in order to improve the accuracy. Some tools also provide an agent that can conduct the scan as an inside out approach, providing results back to the scanner for analysis and reporting. Uh, there's also scanner maintenance. Scanners are also not immune from vulnerabilities themselves. They need regular patching and regular maintenance, just like anything else. Plugins should be re retrieved on a regular basis in order to be effective. Now, network vulnerability scanners range from free to commercial. Some of the most known are Nessus, Qualsys, uh, Nexpose, and OpenVAS. Application scanning tools are common for the software development process. Application testing occurs in three techniques. Oops. You got the dynamic, or yeah, you got the static, which analyzes code without executing it, and dynamic, which runs the code exposing it to a variety of inputs, searching for vulnerabilities, and interactive, which is a hybrid, analyzing the source code while testers interact with the running code. Web application scanners test for web-specific vulnerabilities, like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, and so on. Tools like Burp, OWASP, Zap, Nikito, uh, and others can do this, as well as vulnerability scanners that mentioned like Nessus. I highly suggest Nessus. I have been showing you pictures of Nessus. I love it, but it's not the end all be all. It's one of the best tools around. But the big thing that you need to know today is this bunch of alphabet soup. This is the common vulnerability scoring system. This is how you put a vulnerability to a number, because business does not understand uh, the levels of vulnerability. What they understand is numbers and money. If you can explain a risk in numbers, they can quantify it. They can, they can do stuff with it. They can put a dollar sign to it. That will work. So the common vulnerability scoring system is an industry standard for assessing the severity of a security vulnerability. It provides technique for, measure, for scoring each vulnerability on a variety of measures. Each measure is given both a descriptive rating and a numeric score. The first four measures, uh, first four measures evaluate the exploitability of the vulnerability, whereas the last three evaluate the impact of the vulnerability. The eighth metric discusses the scope of the vulnerability. The first one is the attack vector. How an attacker would exploit this bound vulnerability. So under AV, you'll, you'll see one of these four. Attacks complexity describes the difficulty of exploiting this vulnerability, either high or low. Privileges required. Do you need, what type of account do you need 
uh, or does the attacker need to exploit? User interaction. Do we need another human? Yes or no? Under scope. We have uh, the confidentiality section. Is it going to change? Does it affect the, the C in the CIA triad? Does it affect the I in the CIA triad? Does it affect the A in the CIA triad? So here's where the math gets crazy. And good thing is we have calculators to do all this genetic and sports. So the CSS, a vector uses a single line format to convey the rating of a vulnerability on all six metrics. CVSS provides a good detailed information on the nature of the risk posed by a vulnerability, but we have to do some math to place a number on the value of the vulnerability. So here's an example, a vulnerability we found on SSL, and I have the green arrow pointing to where we're gonna begin looking. We begin with the impact sub score. This metric summarizes the three impact metrics using this crazy math. So you noticed earlier, there, was, there were numbers associated right here. Those numbers now come into play. So there's the math to figure out the, the impact sub score. There are the numbers now given to that, that math is done, and we end up with that. That is the impact sub score. Now we're gonna do the impact score. So we grab the number from the last, we find it's 3.6. If the scope metric says there's going to be a change, then the math is different. If the, if the score section said things are gonna be unchanged, then we stick with the first math, the easier math. The exploitability, which is that whole section, so we did the second half of CVSS first, then we do the first half, is this. So we take all of those things together, multiplying them. 8.22, 8.22, 8.22, 8.22. Against the attack vector, complexity, privileges required, and the user interaction. So we get that number. So now we figure out the base score. If the impact is zero, then the base score is also zero. If the scope was unchanged, the base is calculated by adding impact and exploitability scores. But if the scope said change, then add impact and exploitability and multiply the result by 108. The highest possible base score is 10. And that's really bad. So in our example, we take the impact and the exploitability together, and we get that 7.5 that was shown to us from Nessus. That was a lot of math that I threw at you. Are there questions? Because I know when I saw that first, I was like, what? 
is all this. Understanding how to make the, the math work is good. Uh, I, I will admit it is kind of challenging at first. The good thing though is tools like Nessus not only tell you the breakdown of the vulnerability, but also does the math for you. So you don't have to do the math yourself. But you can explain, then that's what you should be able to do for the Security Plus, is be able to explain this long alphabet soup. And oh, the, uh, the confidentiality, has a high risk of, has a high risk. Integrity doesn't have a big risk. Availability doesn't have a big risk. Do we need a, does this vulnerability require a user? No, it doesn't. You know, being able to explain those things will help you on that test. More so than being able to do the math all on your own. So here is the breakdown of the scores. Anything nine or 10, and you see it on the news. Seven to eight, you also see, but not as, you know, people aren't screaming like chickens with their heads cut off. Irregardless of what any scanner tells you, you always have to verify. You have to verify. When it, uh, it could be accurate, which is a true positive, or it could be inaccurate, a false positive. If a scanner reports a vulnerability is not present, that is a negative report, but also negative reports can be accurate, which is a true negative, or inaccurate, a false negative. Always confirm each vulnerability reported. Draw on your own expertise as well as subject matter experts like data, uh, database administrators, system admins, network technicians, software developers, and so on. Don't just take what the scanner said as gospel. Use things like logs, use things like security information and event management systems like, uh, like Splunk and Greylog and configuration management systems to verify that yes, indeed, this vulnerability exists or no, it doesn't. Applying patches to systems should be one of the core practices of any InfoSec program. Although patches should always be tested before deploying. Don't just deploy just because. All software will eventually be discontinued for support. And that ranges from everything from applications to operating systems. Organizations that continue to run outdated software always put themselves at a significant risk of attack. Unless you have a team of operating system developers, it's really not a good idea to keep an old OS. But it's also true that it's not always easy to just upgrade to the new OS because maybe the hardware can't handle it or there are software restrictions. A best practice would be if you are in that state of isolating 
that system as much as possible, increase monitoring, and have strict firewall rules. It is possible to keep old systems alive and connected. You just have to be more vigilant on them. But don't just walk in to a client and say, oh, you're running old OSs, get rid of them. That's just not, that's a, very, that's a rookie mistake. While debug modes provide developers with crucial information needed to troubleshoot apps, it also provides detailed information of the inner workings of an application and server. This can assist an attacker in developing a successful attack. Debug mode should be disabled for any internet facing system. Nobody should be saying, hey, this is what I'm running. This is my host. This is my operating system. Here's all my information. There are many insecure protocols that are used. Turn them off or block them from reaching the open internet. There's weak encryption. Again, old applications, old OSs aren't able to do the more modern, the more secure stuff. In those cases, you either discontinue using them, which may work, but may also backfire, or you find ways around to proxy communications with that system or that application. When it comes to penetration testing, which would be the next step after doing a vulnerability management, um, you have to adopt the hacker mindset. Cybersecurity defenders spend the majority of their time designing controls and defenses to protect information and systems against a wide array of known or unknown threats. Pen testers need to find a single vulnerability that they might exploit to achieve their goal. Pen testers essentially think like a criminal, finding a single point of entry. They may attempt hundreds or thousands of potential attacks but all it takes is one to be victorious. Cybersecurity professionals need to win every time. Attackers need to win once. Pen test, penetration testing provides visibility into organization security posture that simply isn't available by other means. These tests complement and build on the efforts put in place. These tests provide us with knowledge we can't obtain elsewhere, learning whether an attacker of similar knowledge, skills, and information would likely be able to penetrate defenses. Secondly, pen tests provide a blueprint for remediation, allowing the trace of actions through different stages of the attack and close a series of doors the testers pass through. Lastly, these uh, focus tests allow us to drill into specific defenses and provide actionable insight to prevent a vulnerability from actual exposure. The three test types are these. The black box where there is no information provided to the tester. They have to figure everything out as though it's a, a real attack. The gray, which is a hybrid of the two. The pen tester receives some focus, some information, but not everything. And white, where they're provided with full knowledge of the underlying technology, configurations, and settings of the target. Could also include network diagrams, a list of systems and IP addresses and credentials. In any case, for our pen test, there are some key elements that you need to know that have to be discussed with the client before anything happens. For example, the timeline for the engagement and when the testing can be conducted, what locations, systems, applications, or other potential targets will be included or excluded, 
the data, data handling requirements for information gathered during the test, what behaviors are expected from the target, what resources are committed to the test, all legal concerns, like any laws that cover the target organization, remote locations, service providers, when and how the communications will occur, and of course, permission. In pen testing, the first step after getting all the paperwork through is reconnaissance. Pen tests begin with that, gathering as much information as possible about the target organization. In a white box pen test, the tester will still gather supplemental knowledge with additional techniques. Passive reconnaissance seeks information without engaging with the target, like open source intelligence. Active reconnaissance includes port scans, footprinting to identify the, the OS and applications, and vulnerability scanning. For wireless networks, this means gaining access to the network without physically entering, like war driving or using a drone. Then comes running the test. The attackers will attempt initial access through a vulnerability, through privilege escalation, which is shifting from any internal, any uh, initial access gain to more advanced privileges, such as root or administrator. There's pivoting and lateral movement uses that initial compromise to gain access to other systems on the network and persistence, installing back doors or other mechanisms to regain access later, even if the system gets patched. Then we have cleanup. At the conclusion of the pen test, all the traces of the work done, including the tools, the persistence mechanisms and data should all be removed. The report will detail the vulnerabilities discovered during the test and advise on improving the security posture. And as with anything, there should be continuous training and exercises to help employees understand their role in defending the, the organization from identifying vulnerabilities, tabletop games, step-by-step -step action response with a playbook, capture the flag events, and more. Any questions? So this week's work, it's gonna be fun. You're going to complete a minimum, let me make a new share here. You're completing minimum of three TriHackMe rooms that relate to open source, or to open source of vulnerability management like OpenVast and Nessus. So that's two rooms, two of three that you could use. What we're really looking for here is you having hands-on time with those tools. So go to Try Hack Me, and again, complete a minimum of three rooms, two of which I highlighted here that you are welcome to do. For extra credit, if you have time, and availability, you can either scan your college's site. And for those of you who are watching this recording and are not enrolled in a college that I teach, uh, you can use my, my class.infosecurvin.info site as your target. Submit a report of your findings, including the output from all the tools you used in the scan. I made it zero points so that if nobody turns in anything, it doesn't negatively affect anybody's score because that's not fair. So once again, have fun in three try hack me rooms, minimum three that relate with using vulnerability management tools 
like OpenVAS and S's. And for those of you who want some extra credit, do a Vuln scan on either my site or your colleges. And let me know what you find. Sound good? <laughs>